Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for your patience. We're starting a little bit late this morning, trying to get everybody uh, get everybody together. We've got presenters from from all over the place today, all over uh, from Uganda to Rochester. So uh, I want to welcome you all. My name is Susan Lakin. I'm a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology and the symposium chair um, for this year's symposium. So welcome to our public interest technology session. Um, I'm really excited about this session um, because the focus of the session are projects that are developed with the public interest in mind to better serve our communities. Uh, the projects showcased today demonstrate how immersive technology can be utilized as a method for empathy, a tool to giving voice to those lost, and a means to re-examining our history. Uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom for attendees. And so if you um, are able to um, utilize that to ask questions to the panelists, um, just um, click and answer or, or pose a question there. If we have time at the end of the presentations for the panelists to voice, um, a, um, uh, to voice a response, uh, they will do so. And if not, and there's still questions, they'll be able to type a response uh, afterwards. So please do take advantage of that. Um, so um, our first presentation is going to be a full 25 minute presentation. Um, and then at the end, so it'll be 20 minutes. And then uh, at the end, we'll have five minutes to engage with some questions. Um, they're going to be discussing the use of augmented reality to create participatory art project and an interactive documentary titled Hostile Terrain 94. So please welcome Alvaro Morales, Alex Suber, and Char Stiles. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us. We're excited to kick off the the morning and share a little bit more about the evolution of the project, which is Hostile Terrain 94, the virtual exhibition. Um, my name is Alex Suber. I'm the co-director and um, I'll turn it over to a few other of our team members who are here today. Hi everyone, Alvaro. I'll be uh, running the PowerPoint and excited to get to your questions at the end. Hi everyone, I'm Shara Stiles. Um, I was a programmer uh, on Hostile Terrain 94. Really excited to be here. All right, let me start this uh, thing. Doo -doo. So the beginnings of this project, um, it's a partnership with Jason De Leon and uh, his project called Hostile Terrain 94, uh, which is run by the Undocumented Migration Project. Uh, for the past 10 years, now 11, he's been going to the Sonoran Desert and collecting what many people would consider as trash. Um, and uh, in many academic circles, he was ostracized for, for doing this, but coming from an archaeological background, he treated each object as if it was a, a, a treasure, and uh, he used the, uh, the, the objects as a sort of hook for storytelling and uh, as a way to learn more about the, uh, the circumstances and, and the, uh, the, the whole migration journey, both like what the journey was like, uh, what the migrants hoped to, uh, to arrive to uh, once they got to the US and some of the reasons they, uh, they left their home countries. I can talk a little bit more. So this is the, the evolution of um, the desire to map the deaths uh, on the US side of the US-Mexico border. Um, Jason and his team uh, worked with uh, kind of mapping data around where bodies were found, uh, migrants who had been crossing, and they used these toe tags to visualize the, where the bodies were and a little bit of information or what's known. So you can see there's two different colors. Uh, one color represents the, you know, the unidentified bodies, the other uh, bodies who have been identified. And there, since the early 2000s, uh, there have been about 3,200 
bodies found. And it was a way of really giving a voice and humanizing, uh, making accessible some of that data, which otherwise um, is really just kind of publicly kept data um, there, you know, on a map. So um, this installation, uh, we worked with with Jason to try to build like a digital layer on top of it, which would give you a deeper sense of what's behind these tags. Um, so we, as Alvaro was saying, we saw these objects that he was collecting that people had left behind on their journeys as a hook and, and sort of a, a crack in the door as a way to tell stories about what their lived experience was like. So we chose to use a, a process called photogrammetry, which is 3D scanning of these objects, which you'll see uh, in a little video, and try to tie them to the map in a way um, where people can use their mobile devices to then see them overlaid over uh, over the installation and and tell and use audio and narrative to tell the stories of people who um, had experienced this. Yeah. So throughout the presentation, we'll we'll talk about kind of the the progression of the project, how it started uh, as an idea to do photogrammetry around the the artifacts left behind by migrants, to then an augmented reality experience, uh, to then now still kind of augmented reality, but in many ways not uh, because of uh, the circumstances. Um, so let me I'll, let me play a video of the first minute of the experience that you would see if uh, you pull up the experience on, on your cell phone. Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya, age 31 years old. Reporting date, July 2nd, 2012. Cause of death, exposure. Hostile Terrain 94 is a global exhibition memorializing the more than 3,000 migrants who have lost their lives crossing the Sonora Desert of Arizona since 1994. This contested landscape holds clues to the complicated and often violent process of human migration. The journeys, the struggles, and the increasingly weaponized nature of the U.S.-Mexico border. In this experience, you'll be transported to the desert and hear first-hand accounts from witnesses to the silent crisis on the border. Use the map to navigate their stories. Tap any location to begin. So once viewers get to that um, that menu screen, they'll be able to navigate five chapters, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in uh, later in the presentation. Um, but quickly, Alex, do do you want to quickly go over um, our previous work and how we came about? Yeah. Um, so Alvaro and I met through the medium of virtual reality. We had both been working on uh, longer form documentary projects. Uh, that were in room scale, interactive, immersive environments. Um, we had kind of explored the medium and some of the things that it can do. We were leveraging uh, immersion and the ability to, to kind of surround viewers with the story uh, to tell um, kind of perspective, uh, perspectives. And the, the thing that we struggled with was reaching audiences. Um, we'd been to film festivals and some showings and um, kind of distributed online, but the ability to scale and connect outside of like a smaller circle was, was a bit tricky. Um, so we had kind of put our heads together and started thinking about ways in which we could distribute these uh, stories and experiences and use the same uh, elements and dynamics of the technology, but on people's mobile devices versus like very kind of specific uh, virtual reality hardware. Um, and so we um, worked together to develop this concept um, of building an augmented reality experience with uh, Jason DeLeon's um, objects that he collected and use those uh, as ways for viewers to kind of jump into the story. And I think we have a, a video. 
Yeah, I think this is one of the, uh... great. Do you wanna um, share a little bit about the photogrammetry process or, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll quickly mention this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the idea was uh, trying to do photogrammetry to recreate the, the objects uh, in some sort of virtual space, either in VR, AR, whatever. And this is an example of, of uh, a, a photogrammetry scan of a real life item. Obviously this isn't uh, uh, something that we found in the desert, but it was still applicable to, um, to, to the project. So when we were in the field doing production, we were gathering hundreds of photographs, which you can see on the top left there, um, kind of in a circular motion around um, different areas uh, that were pertinent to the story. For example, this is uh, an unmarked grave niche um, at a cemetery in Arizona. Um, likewise, this is a shrine that was built for uh, a woman named Maricela Zaguepuya, who uh, Jason and his team found her remains in the desert. And as you can see, um, we got a lot of detail out of these scans. These are kind of just initial 3D scans, but the, the thing that really helped us um, with this process is that we could then take these assets. They weren't just um, you know, still photos. We could actually use them and in a way that allows people to interact with them in a way that allows uh, people to place them in their own spaces. Um, so through augmented reality, and that allowed us to build in some of those features um, that are great about the technology in the sense that people can um, really kind of mesh the story with their own world, um, but also allowed it to all run on mobile. Um, and this is kind of where this chapter comes in. Um, Aleta Alvaro will talk about it, but we, we were working with a, a story lab in, in 5G early on. Yeah, so we, we initially prototyped the experience uh, through a grant um, uh, via Riot uh, in uh, that's uh, Verizon's immersive media company and they're trying to um, push uh, a lot of augmented reality and virtual reality storytelling that utilizes uh, 5G in, in some capacity. Uh, so we were selected and, and uh, initially started the project in Unity and as an app-based experience. Uh, throughout everything we've been doing, we were trying to get viewers closer to the desert to see what it's actually like. Uh, like for example, I've been working in immigration for a while now, and uh, the trip to Arizona uh, was really mind blowing because I understood it uh, like intellectually, uh, but setting foot uh, 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 in front of Maricela Shrine and looking at the endless mountains behind me. Um, I think that really brought home uh, uh, a lot of uh, what the experience is actually like. So we're trying to share um, kind of that experience with, with viewers. Um, and that's what led us to uh, start uh, uh, initially with uh, a, a Unity-based app. Uh, you'd have to download something on your cell phone. Uh, the uh, initial, um, kind of mechanic was a branching narrative uh, via uh, interactive audio. So we would ask a, a character a certain set of questions and they would respond uh, depending on which question you asked. Um, and uh, Alex, am I missing any other like main mechanics from that initial experience? Um, not so much. It was just um, very much the augmented reality was in your space. It was a bit of like um, an I spy mechanic of sorts where you were looking for objects in a virtual desert. Um, that was really much a prototype. And we learned a lot about designing the experience and actually like how much interactivity people could handle at once while still uh, digesting the story. So that was uh, this tension between, you know, using all these cool tools in the technology and also having them serve our story. Um, while speech recognition was amazing and, and allowed you to kind of focus on the audio, um, the touch gestures and some of the spatial computing actually were kind of fighting against um, that immersion. So, it, you know, we were trying to do like an interactive podcast of sorts um, with a visual element. And um, we kind of just went through that prototyping phase, as, as many people here may know, and then pulled back from some of these um, interactive features in order to focus on 
floating the story to the top and, and making sure that people were were able to at their own pace kind of digest the the content. Okay, and the this project's greatest asset was the the partnership with Hostile Terrain, the physical installations that were originally going to take place at 150 locations. So we were really excited to create something that would pair uh, with those uh, installations. Um, because that alone would give this immersive media project a wider audience than uh, than most projects, because we would immediately have this this built-in audience through the partner institutions. So here's an example of what we're going to try to do with the uh, augmented reality component um, at the installations. So you put your phone up to one of the toe tags and it would trigger uh, some sort of media, in this case, an interview uh, with a migrant uh, retelling his experiences going back and forth in, in, in the border. You would also be able to trigger uh, 3D models. And these are just uh, rough mock-ups, uh, more to uh, essentially just give an idea of, of what was possible. And the cool thing about this and, and kind of what following up on what I touched on was that it's all able to run in the browser. Um, you don't need any specific hardware. You don't even need an app downloaded. It's something, you know, that is democratized and accessible just through like a QR code or through an email link. Um, so that's really what we were going for was leveraging um, not only like the, the storytelling techniques um, and making them digestible and accessible, but making sure our deliverable format and our um, kind of deployment was turnkey for all of these installations um, so people could access it. And I do want to make sure we have time to talk a little bit of um, tech and go under the hood and talk shop. So um, yeah, I'm um, sure I'll, Char has. A lot. I can either start sharing or you can share the slides. Um, I have the slides here. Great. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Char Stiles. Um, I'm super happy to have been um, included on the tail end of Hostile Terrain's journey um, because definitely the iterations that have, you know, Alex and Avera have gone through has really fine-tuned the experience and the technology is used as like an embellishment to the content. And so I'm going to speak really quickly because that's what the technology is basically a vessel to talk about the content. So I could do next slide. So like I said, hi, I'm Shar. Uh, next slide. Um, my friends are she, her, I do them, and I'm a programmer. Okay, next slide. And so these are the uh, basically like the uh, technologies that are used. It's it's all JavaScript. Um, I use 3JS to render the graphics, DepthKit.js to render the uh, interviews, Glitch.com for hosting, Express and Browserify for like the app architecture. You can hit next. Yeah, so that's basically um, all, all that was used. Um, it's been a it's been a lot of a uh, lot of tech iterations, especially to like get the story where we really wanted it to. So it's kind of like wrangling the tech in to be able to tell the story. Um, next slide. So I have a like a beginning. Also, I, I included like an early kind of prototype. I guess it goes along with what um, what was showing before um, that we had an idea of the hero mark. So it was a marker, and then there would be like a portal that opened. I just wanted to show like a very very early prototype. Uh, where you could like gaze inside. Next slide. Um, and yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's all it. I also wanted to just say like like thanks for you know thanks for having me. I've been it's it's been like a great um, it's 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 been an amazing like combination of of tech and uh, storytelling that uh, you know as a programmer I don't really get to experience a lot. So thank you for having me. Yeah, um, and maybe we can show you, if you flip back a few slides, like one chapter, just to close this out, um, what this ended up looking like, because we've we've just gone through the, the kind of background, but um, we'll also at the very end of this, like when we do Q&A, we'll just pull up the, the link and you can actually snap it with your phone camera um, and try it yourself after this. Um, so this is the kind of one example of a, a chapter. My name is Bob Key. I'm uh, from Tucson, and I'm with Tucson Samaritans. Uh, 
Uh, the type of aid that we provide the migrants in the desert is uh, food, water, medical aid as well, uh, and uh, if needed, uh, transportation out of the desert. In 2011, in the Altar Valley, which is uh, 45 minutes west of, of Tucson, uh, I discovered uh, remains who were later identified as uh, Jose Luis Cruz Cruz. I went down to a stream bed, uh, happened to look ahead, and I saw what I knew to be a skull, and uh, walked about 100 feet, and the remains were there. So this is the link to the, the latest experience. Um, it's still in the lost, a soft launch process. Um, we'll be releasing it uh, in two weeks, I believe. Um, so please check it out. Please give us your feedback. Um, and there's our contact information. Thank you so much. Just such an amazing project. So powerful. I just appreciate you all sharing that with us. And my understanding is that you're bringing the exhibition to RIT in the near future, or at least uh, trying to arrange that. And um, I am very excited to, to be able to, uh, to hopefully we were able to host that. Um, so again, for attendees uh, in the Q&A box, if you have any questions, we do have uh, a couple of more minutes left. So I encourage you guys to, um, to address any questions. Our panelists, if you have any questions, you can also uh, use the chat box um, and um, pose some questions there as well too. It's Friday morning, people are a little quiet this morning. <laughs> uh, here we go. Can you all see that? Yeah, um, I think I click answer live. Yeah. Um, so, so the question was, what was your photogrammetry process? Um, it's a great question. Um, we experimented with a few different types and there were kind of two different scenarios. One was like a controlled environment where we were in a museum and we had access to the archive of, of Jason's uh, artifacts. And so we had like a green screen uh, set up behind uh, our objects and we had a turntable. So there's this lazy Susan type turntable and uh, just like a mirrorless uh, DSLR camera. And we would uh, set the turntable to turn and we would take uh, about 15 to 20 photos from all angles. Uh, and then we would do that from different uh, vantage points. So you can capture the full 360 volume of that object. And then we used a, a piece of software called uh, Reality Capture, um, which I would definitely recommend. Um, that runs a kind of computation algorithm on all those photos to find the relationship of space between the different photos, um, which then spits out a very dense model of that photo, or of that object rather, like a 3D mesh and a texture. And then the, the process um, that actually ended up being the most time consuming part is optimizing that model. So for anyone who's kind of in the 3D world, like we're talking about tens of millions of tries or polys. Um, and then we need to get that down to roughly five to 10,000 tries at most um, for a file delivery size of one to two megabytes to run on a browser on your phone. So um, the process is really starting with as much data as you can and then whittling that down into the smallest deliverable package you can in order to distribute it over the web. Great, thank you. So it looks like we have one more question here. Can you tell us more about the grant writing process and the relationship with Verizon as a funder? Sure, um, I'll quickly answer that. Uh, and maybe if you have time for 
that last question, we can get to it as well. Um, grant writing process was pretty simple. They had a uh, open call in December of 2018, I believe. Um, and uh, we were part of a lab and then we pitched a project a few weeks later uh, as part of the lab. Um, and Verizon was very hands-off um, for uh, better or for worse, uh, in our case, better. Uh, I was a little surprised that they uh, funded this type of very political project um, and was also glad that they were very hands-off. So it looks like we've run out of time, but um, we do still have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So if you all um, wouldn't mind um, answering those uh, by typing in your answer, uh, and then everybody would be able to see that answer as well too. Excellent. So again, thank you so much. Amazing thank project you. and look forward to having you guys to RIT. Likewise, thank thanks you. for having us. So our next uh, full presentation is from a group um, of University of Pennsylvania undergraduates. Uh, who created the first AR tour to investigate their university's historic ties to slavery. Um, presenting are the uh, students, Van Jessica Gladney and Dallas Taylor. Also joining them are Kathleen Brown, Alexis Broderick, Megan Moody, and Matt Tidridge. So welcome. And if you guys want to turn on your videos. And I think Dallas, are you um, sharing your screen? Uh, it's Van Jessica, but um, Van Jessica. Okay, so I, I will guess, yeah. let you take it away now. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Nice to virtually see you. I suppose um, I'm Dallas. I'm the project manager for this project. Um, someone else wants to go next. I got my popcorn. <laughs> Then Jessica, you're muted if you're talking. <laughs> Did I share the screen? Can you see the screen? All right. Hi, I'm Van Jessica. I've um, been with the project since day one as a student researcher and then a public history fellow, and I guess sort of a digital historian, and I'm a PhD student at Penn. All right, so let's get started. Um, so this is, uh, we are the Penn and Slavery Project, and we have uh, fo focused our project around blending public history and augmented reality. So we started the project because in 2006 and 2016, the university made two separate statements claiming that we had no direct ties to the institution of slavery. Um, and so being, you know, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful professor. Uh, professor Kathleen Brown collected five graduate, uh, five undergrad students, and um, we set out to disprove that claim. So over the span of our project, we've broken our findings down into a few areas. So we focused on slave ownership and uh, found that 18th century trustees and faculty owned or helped trade enslaved people. Uh, then we found out that Penn collected donations from slave owners in its early days. Um, it, when we looked into the history of our medical school, we found that there was um, a lot of involvement in certifying race science or scientific racism, such as phrenology, uh, finding medical or physical differences, most many of which have led to medical misinformation that still plagues the field today. And we did some research on the campus, finding buildings and slave or uh, statues honoring slave owners. So after doing a lot of presentations, we decided to make a website. And um, we followed the trend of the breaking down of the breakdown of our project. So here is our website. We've broken it into the slave ownership, finances, it features documents and um, truncated versions of student reports that are required for the course, campus. Um, and then we decided to, you know, tell a little bit about ourselves. But we kept, you know, getting kind of interested in this idea that the legacies of our history were present on our current campus. And after doing some digging on the Penn site, I saw that Penn has mapped out um, a lot of its historical connection with historical trees. So we said, uh, why can't they do that with their connections to slavery? So we built a team. All right, so this is this is where I sort of came into the project. So Van Jessica did a wonderful job sort of laying out the, the ideation and the idea and, and the 
reasoning behind the project, and this is sort of where the Avengers-esque sort of collaboration came into to play. Um, so, you know, this was where we built the team and, and the pictures you see up here are of what I deem as the most important people to this project. So the actual student researchers who did the work. Um, and then uh, Alexis is also in there. So not technically a student, but a fellow researcher and she's, she's also amazing. Um, so there was just student researchers, there was faculty and fellows. Um, on the next slide, we have an even greater assortment of pictures of everyone. Um, so there's people from the Penn Libraries, people from Digital Humanities. Um, so we, we have some student developers in here. We have some a, a student project manager, that would be me, um, librarian. So Megan was helping us out an incredible amount when she was um, at the university along with, like there's too many names that we could say and we'll get bogged down here for our whole 20 minutes trying to name every single person. Um, but it was a great time and then we, we, we also try to to keep um, local artists and activists um, as central to the production of this project. And then of course, um, as, as Matt is here today, Dream Syndicate, um, who has truly made our imagination into a reality. So, or a virtual reality, I should say. Um, and it's been, or augmented reality. Okay. And it's been great. <laughs> but that's, that's what I would say. It's the Avengers-esque coming together of all these different parts. And um, we can talk a little bit more about that later too. And so the Avengers assembled and made the augmented reality app. Um, so originally we meant the app to be a tour of the campus. Um, oh no, hang on, it's really bad quality. All right. so. We originally wanted the app to be a tour of the campus, but um, but over time, we realized that it wouldn't be a good idea to um, force people to go into one certain direction and if people didn't have time to go or didn't want to walk all the way we wanted to make sure that each stop encapsulated both the message and as much content of our project as possible so we decided to uh, make the route suggested instead of mandatory we also have voiceovers you can't hear them but they are voiceovers uh, for each of the different sections of the app so this would have started out with um, we don't have any audio of Benjamin Franklin, but we have uh, information about our advisory warnings and the different um, information about how to use an augmented reality app, trying to make this as accessible as possible. Um, so what happens is you can select a certain location and you can uh, focus in on one specific location of the campus. And then you learn some information about it. A lot of this is on our website, but as I said, we're trying to um, uh, make the information a little more digestible. So in each spot, there's a spotlight um, information, uh, a spotlight uh, profile where we, you know, zero in on one specific aspect of one specific actor in the project. Um, oh my God, I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, so for this one, this is the slavery science talking about the medical school and also focusing on the Penn Museum. Uh, one of the cool parts about these stop pages is that we decided to kind of invite the viewers into our research process by giving them some views of the archival documents and primary sources that our students have used to do research. Um, so people can kind of do the research with us. And then one of the coolest parts of the project is where we introduce the AR. So you scroll all the way to the top and then you click this wonderful start AR button and the AR experience begins. Now the great thing about this one is that we wanted to bring the artifacts and items that were in the museum outside of the museum to move what was considered a private history to public history. So the dome spawns and all these artifacts are all surrounding you. Um, and then if you press different artifacts, it comes with information and contextualizing the artifacts in a way that uh, some museums don't or don't do it as well as we would like. So we decided to contextualize the artifacts that we are bringing to our viewers. Um, another stop that we did was the generation stop. So if you've been to Penn, Penn's campus or not, this is the generations bridge. Basically what happens is there's bricks all lining here, fancy people who've donated things and their names 
names are on buildings. And it kind of creates like a long list of legacies and names of who helped build the university. And we felt that some stories were left out. So we decided to add to that story. Um, so it's on the other side of campus, click, go in. Once again, you have the um, different information. Uh, the spotlight is a specific archival document. And for this one, this is a sharecropping document uh, that focuses on the actual uh, historical lineage of the student researcher who conducted this research. She was a Penn alum when we started this project and now she's in my cohort uh, at Penn grad school. So this might be one of my favorite stops. So we rendered, they, ah, it's so cool. Um, so that is an actual quilt that spawns in front of the bridge, kind of, you know, adding to the story of the bridge. And mo just like all of our stops, it has the voiceovers. This one specifically features the student researcher who conducted this research, as well as the different parts of the research that she presented. These are clips from a, docu a documentary that she made about her family, interviewing different members of her family and um, kind of uh, you know, showcasing the multimedia aspect of this app and the possibilities of augmented reality. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on the ways that slavery created dis discrepancies in wealth and educational opportunities and the ways that we had to actually change the campus so that the history of the students who attend it and the history of <clears throat> the people who helped build it and fund it uh, could be featured on the campus. Dallas? Yeah, yeah. So once again, Vegesica sort of did a wonderful job in laying out um, what the app is sort of about and in, in the story that we're trying to tell um, and sort of just going on about the process of actually making all of that into a thing. Um, something that we really tried to keep at the forefront was a, a sort of document that we made about critical questions. And these, these questions were sort of critical of, of the project and what we were doing, but also critical to it, I would say, in terms of like what we were sort of um, using it as to, to, to think through what we were doing. Um, and it's very easy to look at all of that and be like, oh, like, of course, you could have this and you'd have this and you'd have this. But there was a while there where we didn't even think of having like a page before the AR. It was simply just AR. And it, it, it's, it's weird to think about that because it's so crucial to to thinking through, at least to us, like the accessibility of that information. And, and someone might not, you know, um, have the time or ability to use the AR and, and being able to still have that information readily um, accessible. So, so thinking through accessibility was really big for us. So, so having um, caption files, having voiceovers, um, having it be able to be uh, done from wherever you're located um, was something big for us. So thinking through that as well. Language, believe it or not, every single word in that app is green lighted through ridiculous amounts of conversation about what language made the most sense. To, to have in the app and, and making sure that we were extremely um, particular in the way that we were wording things. Um, having input from people. So we, we had multiple focus groups, um, as you can see down here too. Um, so we would we would reach out to people that we thought, you know, like thinking about our audience and who the audience was and, and who we really wanted to target and asking them, does this make sense? What does this really do? Um, so that was also a question like, what are we trying to do with this? Um, and that's something I think everyone in this group could talk about differently um, in terms of what we think this could do. Because I, I think it could do one thing, Van Jessica probably thinks it could do another thing. Everyone in here thinks it could do something. Um, but then also being very critical of AR as a tool. So like what does augmented reality actually offer? And that was something that we really had to grapple with at the same time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. Um, so some highlights and challenges. Uh, collaboration. Um, this was a highlight and a challenge, I would say, because it, it was it was the best of both worlds in terms of, you know, you're getting all these different perspectives. You have these student developers that have never heard of this history before um, and sort of forcing them to think about this history and, and then having them sort of lay their uh, logic of, of software development and coding into the framework of what we're doing was extremely useful for us to in, in, in terms of the ways that we thought about what was possible. Um, because for some of us, it was like, oh, so we can do that? We, we can make that a, a thing? And that was, for the first month, that was about the only conversation we had is about what was actually possible. 
um, having artists come in, having activists come in, having fellows, designers, researchers, like et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. And I was having trouble sort of trying to develop these categories because at the same time, so much of us exist in, in, in both of these roles at the same time. So this is sort of in between this for a lot of us. Um, a big highlight for me, and, and this is, I was sort of thinking about it last night when we had to sort of get ready. I think it's sort of like a, a culmination of a group learning experience. Like the app itself, when I look at it, I'm like, this is just like everything that we sort of learned for the past two years, just put into one small thing. Um, and in the many iterations that it's been through that people won't see like the, the different sort of mock-ups and whatnot. Um, and there was ridiculous amounts of trial and error at the same time. Like the, this is, you know, and we have dream syndicate to think <laughs> time and time again for making it work. Um, but there, there was trial and error throughout. And um, if Van Jessica, if you could show what our plan was for it, you know, um, this was our original plan in, in 2019. <laughs> so we started the app in about May. We were like, all right, by July 15th, we're really going to finish this up. <laughs> we're going to get it on the App Store. And it's still not on the App Store. It's very close. So just don't think we're not doing something here. But um, this was the original plan, and it shows that like it's it's not you know always what it's meant to be. Um, and I think what was really important for us throughout that process that was keeping it student led at its core um, in all aspects. So whether it be Van Jessica, um, myself, Mal Malkia, who was extremely useful, oh, mm -hmm. useful that's a terrible word, extremely influential in this project, um, the student developers and designers, um, student artists who sort of helped develop the art behind the app. Um, but I will say faculty and staff were there supporting us every step of the way. So Kathy, Alexis, Megan, Lori, like every, I, there's so many people I can name, Kim, um, Katie, like there's too many people. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get some important names in there. Um, yeah, so like, <laughs> that's the only way this project was able to make it this far because of their support. And, and because, um, you know, we weren't able to finish that for <laughs> summer, which was a ridiculous timeline looking back, but. Um, yeah, those are some of the, the highlights and challenges, I would say, of the project. Not coding challenges, because, I mean, Matt could probably answer some of those questions better than I could. Oh, yeah, no, we didn't do any of the coding stuff. <laughs> um, um, but Dallas is absolutely right. We do have a credit section on our website, and there's so many names that just helped us build this project in ways that would not have been possible without every single person, every single organization, support from every single administrative person. Uh, roommates testing the app, just cats keeping us awake so that we could continue working on this. It was just, I don't know, it's been really cool watching all these different pieces of our university and our community come together. Um, I don't know how to exit out of this. Um, so, uh, all right. So there's that. Um, but because we all came together, um, we really combined these different elements to make a like a public archive. So here is the bell that features very largely through our project, through our research, and is the symbol of our project. Um, and here are some of the, uh, like an example of the documents that we were rifling through the archives to find. And this is actually Bree's blank, Brianna's blanket that we used a 3D scanner to scan and um, render in the app. I don't think I'm using any of those words correctly, but um, it's just really cool how many different people and how many different pieces of history and like real materials came together to make this app. So thank you for listening. Kathleen, did you have a comment? You need to unmute yourself. Um, so I just want to say, um, Van Jessica and Dallas, as always, absolutely amazing and wonderful. And you've so captured the dynamic, the energy, the creativity, but also, you know, your the ways that both of you really anchored this project. Um, I want to just do quick, two quick points. One is that we had substantial support from the provost office at the University of Pennsylvania. I just, I know they were listed in the credits, but that actually made a big difference for our project. Um, 
We also had some early advice and guidance from Monument Lab, and I just want to be sure we kind of did um, a shout out to them. We partnered with um, the library at Penn, which is Megan's and Katie's um, part of this, and uh, Dallas and Ben Jessica have already acknowledged them, but I just want to be clear that that was a, a really key partnership. And the last thing I want to mention, as a person who's not at all on the tech side of this, one of the amazing adaptations that came about during the COVID pandemic was that the um, design syndicate, uh, sorry, dream syndicate um, actually adapted to our concerns that people wouldn't be able to go on campus and take the tour and have made the augmented reality experience available through the phone, even for somebody who's not on campus. Um, and for me as a non-tech person, that also strikes me as this kind of amazing COVID um, constraint that turned into you know, something quite miraculous. Um, so I just wanna thank Dallas and um, Van Jessica again for a phenomenal presentation that so captured everything wonderful about this project and make sure we acknowledged all the other people who, we, without whose support we couldn't have done it. So we have a, a little bit of time if you wanna answer, uh, there's a couple of questions in the question box. Uh, the first one says, thanks for sharing this amazing project. I would imagine that the process itself is super educational and valuable to all involved. Are you thinking of it as a living project that continually brings uh, in new contributions, both to improve the result and for the experience it brings everyone involved? I, I can answer that. Um, I, the answer, the simple answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, the project has always been an evolving uh, kind of living organism. I mean, we've, uh, Kathy and I taught the seminar for two years and um, it's gonna be offered again uh, next year. So when we have more student research, I mean, the project itself and the app are um, you know, symbiotic. And obviously what we have now and what we've developed is a discrete app with six uh, AR experiences, um, but we always wanted to keep the door open to expanding that, um, even expanding the app, but certainly expanding uh, and continuing with the research um, that that's going to be an ongoing process. Uh, and as we also like to say, once you're in the Pen and Slavery Project, um, as a member, you're really in it for life. So even though uh, Megan, uh, Megan Moody and I have gone to different universities as of this year, um, we're, we're still involved and we're still in all the meetings. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's really, it's bigger. It's become, you know, something that's bigger than any one of us. And it certainly is gonna continue um, to be a, a living project in the future. That is great. I loved seeing just the depth of the collaboration was wonderful. So we have time for one last question here. This is a very interesting project. Uh, maybe I missed the information, but I would like to know which technologies did you use for the development of the project? I can take this one. So uh, we originally started uh, with a small team of student developers and designers as Dallas and Van Jessica mentioned. And um, to do a lot of the 3D modeling, the students were using Maya. And um, for the actual development of the app, um, they were using uh, Unity for that part of it. And then there were also um, other technologies. I don't recall like which 3D scanner we used in particular and Dallas um, or Matt, if you wanna chime in as well on what else we used. Or if I didn't cover all of that. Matt, you got it. I, I don't wanna. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, that was a good, that was a good uh, overview, Megan. So um, yeah, because we were leaning a lot on, um, you know, after taking a look through and seeing all of the kind of um, work and research the team was doing, um, it seemed like Unity was a great fit just because of um, a lot of the narrative and storytelling elements um, were going to be in 3D and using, uh, you know, light and videos and a lot of different kind of real-time medias and mediums. So um, Unity was a good fit just because it was uh, a good way to kind of bring 3D, 2D, 
elements all kind of together into augmented reality in a way that was uh, accessible from a lot of different mediums because there were so many different team members working on it. Um, oh, we also oh I had some 360 videos um, that we were editing in Premiere and um, using the Insta 360 1X cameras for those as well. And then Matt, I cut you off if you had something else. No, yep, yep. That's uh, like doorways and portals and things. So there was kind of a, a bunch of different ways to tell different stories. So um, yeah, that was a good fit, 3D 360. Thank you, thank you so much. It looks like we're out of time, but we do have one more question that's in the Q&A. So if you guys, looks like you actually, somebody must have already answered it because it's gone away. Awesome, thank you, Van Jessica. <laughs> Um, so again, thank you. Wonderful project. Um, just love the depth of it and the layers and, and happy to hear that it's continuing on. So um, our next uh, speakers uh, is our final presenters. Um, and this is Barnabas Samuel and Sabit Martin John. So if you all want to turn on your videos and um, our uh, pen group, turn yours off, which you did. So if we got, uh, oh, there we go. And how about Barnabas? There we go, awesome. So um, uh, Samuel and, um, or I'm sorry, Barnabas and Sabit will be giving a 10 minute flash talk uh, to discuss how they're using uh, virtual reality for peace building in refugee camps of Northern Uganda. So I'll let you uh, gentlemen take it away if you wanna unmute yourselves. There you go. Barnabas, you wanna unmute yourself? Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to participate uh, at this symposium. Uh, since I'm here with my colleague, I will start introducing myself and uh, the institution I work for and give a quick uh, background about our Viera for Peace Initiative. And he will add a bit of more information. Uh, I'm Sebe Martin. I am the executive director and, and co-founder of the Community Development Center. Uh, we are a community concerned refugee-led organization with roots in community media. Our, our mission is to work for community development and poverty mitigation and always providing empowerment and creating platforms for community development. And uh, we are harnessing the power of technology to facilitate an equitable, informed community and, uh, and build resiliency, always seeking to help the vulnerable, under-resourced and underrepresented, conflict-affected and displaced communities. Uh, I'm speaking to you in Uganda. Uh, Uganda is one of the largest refugee hosting nations in the world with over 1.4 million. Uh, majority are from South Sudan uh, due to decades of war and the ongoing conflict. South Sudan have at most lived their lives knowing war, hearing sounds of guns, uh, in fear of bombs and bullets, experiencing violence and the persecution and witnessing horrors at the hands of various armies and militias including loss of loved ones, rapes, looting, and destruction of property. And the most vulnerable among those are women and children who suffer the worst forms of abuses and harms, e.g. Uh, their recruitment into army, uh, uh, there is mimming, there is rape, and many other traumatic experiences, both uh, uh, for those in the IDP camps and the uh, conflict-affected areas in the refugee camps in Uganda. Uh, in the refugee camps, still tribal tension and, uh, and conflict persists from one camp to another. Most refugees have carried out their emotional baggage and, um, and there is fear and distrust between refugee communities and, diff uh, and difficult relationship with the, the host communities. Like recently, there was uh, a lot of killings among uh, the refugees and so forth, and the conflict has grown to a situation which is uh, resistant to many peace building approaches. So that is why we came up with uh, the VRA approach, uh, the VRA for Peace uh, initiative. So um, I think uh, in the VRA for Peace initiative, uh, since I'm here with uh, Barnaba Samuel, so uh, he will elaborate more on our project and how we are 
uh, building empathy and how we are promoting peaceful coexistence through the, uh, the, the Viara for Peace project. So, Barnabas, you can pick from me. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, as she mentioned, I think with this initiative, we are uh, trying to explore the use of VR technology as a tool for peace building. Uh, the idea is actually to give the refugee community the space and tools to express themselves. We asked how we can bring different conflict groups to meet and engage uh, in dialogue and build some understanding, some mutual understanding. We asked how uh, VR can give the refugees uh, and the refugee community the space and provide the means to express themselves and find healing from past bitterness and reconciliation. Um, we see that um, the tool is there. Uh, VR will be able to help to bring the results in the change of behaviors and altitude and to promote peace and uh, reconciliation. Uh, as we have uh, on the screen, our goal uh, of the virtual reality for peace building is to use VR to build empathy and trust and enable communities to talk about the experience and the conflict and the, the create a space, uh, a safe space for dialogue towards a sustainable peace. So what did we do? Um, what we're doing actually, uh, we, work to create and develop VR contents with the refugees themselves from different ethnic groups. And um, yes, made uh, uh, 360 VR uh, videos, enabling uh, the community members to actually uh, experience each other in a very unique way uh, virtually. We then do organize uh, VR events and uh, after these VR events as a culture uh, among the South Sudanese refugees, we did what we call uh, the shy or the tea conversation. Just like conversations which can enable the groups that are viewing uh, and experiencing uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, videos uh, we have on uh, VR uh, to talk about them. And uh, this was a little bit very helpful. One of the projects that uh, we had been uh, working on is the uh, the Halima, uh, Helim to Halima. Helim to Halima, this is an Arabic uh, 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 phrase that means uh, Halima's dream. So in the Halima's dream, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't bring it here. I, I wish I, I had it. So that I can bring it here. Um, it's a 360 VR story of Halima. Uh, Halima talks about the effects of conflict within uh, the effects of conflict in our country and uh, difficulties that she went through. Uh, the, we are able to capture and uh, bring in uh, the effects of conflict in the village of Halima and where Halima came from. And uh, we also have um, Alima sharing about her dream for a peaceful village and prosperous country. And uh, talking about what she thinks uh, is necessary to realize this. So similar uh, projects, we worked on similar projects uh, as part of this pilot, a number of two or three projects, but spe specifically on the Halima's um, Helim to Halima project, uh, we intend to see that it projects the reality and uh, provokes change of perspectives and uh, bringing these communities together in a way that uh, they can build the next community and the future they want. And uh, it creates a kind of uh, vivid awareness on the effects of conflict and enables communities to make a resolve to end it all um, and etc. So this is uh, basically what uh, we had been doing in, in Rhino Camp. Uh, we had been organizing series of uh, events and um, we also enabled um, 
uh, we do something using uh, uh, this project. We enable communities from uh, the other ethnic group and uh, villages to be able to meet each other. And uh, what we do is like, as, as, as my colleague stated earlier, the, the kind of conflict we have in uh, South Sudan uh, it continues to be a problem in such a way that even in the settlement, uh, communities and ethnic groups from other settlements could not easily come to other settlements where there are different ethnic groups. And so what happens is uh, uh, through VR, we enable uh, these communities to be able to uh, communicate among each other, experience uh, and meet each other and dialogue. So this is uh, particularly why this is becoming uh, a very kind of important initiative. Uh, this was recently in you know, 3 and uh, where we have, uh, as you can see in the background, uh, uh, is uh, Ofoa 3 the refugee settlement in Northern Uganda. It's still a pilot project. We just started it a few months ago, but we are uh, really excited uh, how this is uh, uh, ha happening. Uh, so far, right now, we have a number of groups uh, in different villages uh, that represents all the ethnic uh, groups in uh, uh, the South Sudanese refugees and other refugees, uh, particularly in the settlement, uh, that are working together to create uh, content and tell their own stories. So uh, VR360 storytelling uh, becomes very uh, important. Uh, uh, through using the uh, this uh, initiative uh, that is so uh, helping uh, right now where we are working, particularly we are working in a, a four three and a Tika zone. And uh, as my colleague was stating, uh, even this year we have a series of conflict that has been happening in these places. But uh, through uh, this project, we are happy to see that. Uh, community members uh, have the opportunity now through virtual reality to uh, share perspectives and share the reality and um, uh, work together to uh, build the community uh, that they want. So that is so uh, quick uh, from us. Um, I don't know whether my colleague want to get back and, and, and say something. Uh, about this, but uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Great, thank you so much. Just a really important work that you're doing and, and we're really grateful that you uh, joined us today to share that, uh, um, yeah, the work that you're doing. It looks like, um, oops, can we maybe put your contact information back up there for a minute? I think that was a little quick. I'll let you share screen again, just so everybody gets a chance to, to record that. Great, thank you. Just leave that up there for a second as we close out so everybody can get that down. Um, so wanna thank all of our uh, presenters today in the public interest technology session. I think it's just extremely important that as we're developing this new immersive technology that we're very conscious of the consequences of the technology on society and also to utilize that technology for the public good. So I applaud um, all of our presenters for these amazing projects that you're all spearheading and um, taking on uh, this new evolving technology uh, for the public interest. So um, we are going to um, head to the hubs rooms. Uh, Tessa, if you can put in the chat for the attendees and all the participants, um, she's gonna put in there the um, uh, hubs links. Um, I'm just trying to pull up my chat box here. So she has those hubs links up there for you all. So everybody is welcome to um, join us. Uh, in the hubs rooms with our presenters, and um, uh, you can continue to engage and ask questions. 
So again, thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, session will be at 1030 and that's the um, education um, presentation.